My name is Brian Wish. I'm an entrepreneur, CEO, and Pathfinder. If I've learned anything in life, it's that self-discovery is a critical part of living intentionally, building meaningful relationships, and achieving the future we see for ourselves. In July of 2021, I sold all my possessions, headed west, and began a quest to live a fuller and more meaningful life. The experience helped me truly understand the power of a single moment. And through my conversations with leaders from all walks of life, I've seen how that one phone call, heartbreak, diagnosis, or lost job can transform the entire course of our lives. In this podcast, I sit down with entrepreneurs, influencers, and experts across industries to talk through the events that changed everything. Together, we'll relive the make or break decisions, hard conversations, periods of despair and hope, chance encounters, and everything that followed. Andrea Fiegel is the founder and CEO of Health Finance Institute and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University who brings passion and ambition to her work in global health policy, financing, and governance. Outside of her work in healthcare, Andrea is trained as a ballet dancer and holds an international teaching certificate in classical ballet. Andrea writes and speaks publicly in order to close the knowledge and implementation gap when it comes to global healthcare, especially related to non-communicable diseases. She is recognized as an innovator of the Evidence Formal Coverage Index metric for the universal healthcare coverage. As a young woman, an unfortunate oversight by an authority figure almost derailed the entire course of Andrea's life. Find out how Andrea reclaimed her future in a high-pressure situation today on The One Away Show. Andrea, welcome to The One Away Show. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Yeah. I'm excited. Thanks for being here. Uh, so, Andrea, what is the one away moment that you want to share with us today? Yeah. So, I was, I think, 16 years old, and I had applied for this um, international college called the United World College. And the year that I applied to the school, that's like a scholarship only school. Um, there was some corruption going on in the government and they deferred it for a year. But the year after, my principal didn't share the application with me. And so I found about it out about it in a roundabout way when the first round of um, deliberations had already passed. And then um, we basically had to contact the Ministry of Education saying, hey, we applied last year. Can we still enter that round? And so we got a call back and, you know, I picked up the phone. It was one of those old phones, you know, those old dial phones still. It was like in a, um, on one of the furniture items in our, in our living room. And, and I remember like picking up the call and that woman from the ministry saying, hi, you know, this is deputy minister so-and-so. And I regret to inform you that we cannot make an exception for you. And my face must have just turned like completely white in that moment i was just and my mom she was like a hero in that moment she basically she saw me she sprang into action she took the you know the receiver from me and said hi this is you know andrea's mom and andrea has to go to the school and we applied last year and we wrote everyone and this year this wasn't communicated to us and i know my daughter and she has to go to the school Mm. and you know if not for that phone call my entire life would have looked differently and so basically the woman in the ministry said well you know okay well you have 24 hours to get all the application materials to us plus a written statement and, and, and letters from three of your teachers, your main classroom teacher, and a written note of apology from your principal that you were not offered the opportunity to apply. So I stayed up until like whatever, two, 3 a.m. in the morning, getting everything in tow. All the teachers were very supportive. And then the next day in the morning, I think we had to fax over everything by noon or something. And at 10 a.m., my main classroom teacher went into the principal's office and I heard them argue. She was like, Andrea has to go to school. She's meant for greater things. She needs to leave this little town. And he was like, oh, you know, that we are a great school here too. And, oh, and I was like going back and forth and I was like sweating blood, you know? I was just, 
Mm. Half an hour later, she exited with that signature and we faxed everything over. And of course I had to go through the, you know, application process and there were like in-person two day interviews because they only pick two students per country per year. But if not for my mom in that moment, picking up that student and going, this is the school for my daughter, um, you know, um, my life would have looked very differently and here's why. So basically that school is an international baccalaureate school. Um, it has a very high grade point average for graduating students. It's international. There's a lot of scholarship offers to graduates from that school. And it really allowed me kind of to spread my wings. I was in Norway at, that's at one of the 10 schools in Norway. There are now 16 all around the world. And it promotes international understanding. And I studied with 200 uh, students from 83 different countries. Um, shared a room with four other girls from like, you know, all the continents of this world represented. And um, the door was really open for me for an international education. And then I got a full scholarship to study in the States, uh, so both in the States and in Canada. I decided to study in Canada. Um, and then, you know, uh, I was just able to build an international career and also go to school without, you know, because of my grades and because of that school like without any student debt also. So it was, you know, really a, a life-changing moment um, and setting me up for a more international versus a national career back home in Austria. Well, thanks for sharing such a story of resilience and uh, sheer will uh, to, get, <laughs> to clearly get uh, where you wanted to go. And uh, I'm not surprised knowing you. My question is, is your principal, you know, there, there's an application delay, uh, maybe you didn't know, Clearly, was trying to protect the school versus kind of letting you uh, kind of run free. But what was it about this um, school ministry that you saw for yourself, that you saw greater heights for yourself than what was currently in place yeah. it was? I always was a person who loved, like, I always believed you have to love what you do and do what you love. And that, you know, you shouldn't just live for the weekend and that you should fill your every day with meaningful activities. And I also wanted to be among individuals that were really driven. So I was always, you know, sticking out a little bit like a sore thumb, like I always had great, you know, straight A's and I always was doing extra work and reading extra books and doing extra activities. And I wasn't really challenged enough. And it was also difficult to find sort of peers because, you know, because of my extra drive, you know, I was doing ballet next to my high school and I was just, you know, I was just a very driven individual. And I felt that I didn't find that resonance um, among my peers. So I think that was one thing I wanted to basically study among individuals who both cared for, about making an impact in this world. And I also wanted to be, you know, among people that had similar ambitions or a similar level of ambition that I had. Um, and then also like I felt my upbringing wasn't, I mean, there were challenges in their family life in a day to day. And I just felt that just being away from it all and kind of crafting my own way was the best and healthiest way for me to grow. And it was also a way for me to see the world again. So I had three siblings and we we're working class. We didn't do a lot of traveling. So like having an opportunity to study abroad and do international trips and, you know, meet the world, you know, basically by studying with students from all over the world. Like it was just something that I gravitated towards and really um, shaped me and also something that, um, yeah, I was drawn to because of my interest in international development, um, into global health at that point already. And I also wanted to kind of, you know, I don't know, I wanted to study um, at a university with like-minded peers and and really um also craft a very high level like um academic path for myself yeah that's interesting and just to clarify you were ha you were how old uh, at this stage so i so i applied when i was 16 and then mm -hmm. um i think i was just turning 17 when i then left for the school and it was the last two years of high school so it was mm -hmm. a little it delayed the graduation a little bit but it was worth it because you know it, yeah. it was kind of that you know yeah. Yeah, you, you, you right you, left. <laughs> yeah, and so you at 16 years old, you were, you know, you you'd already kind of found and you started to really, it was clear to yourself about your kind of work ethic and drive. And it was also very clear that you want to have a bigger impact on the world. Uh, what, 
I mean, just out of curiosity, Andrea, were these were these conversations at the table at home or experiences or, or, or what, like what I call it? Like, an, it's like a healthy intensity or in like, is that <laughs> life? like, where, like, do you think that was, you were born with that? Or do you think uh, there were any life events that kind of shaped that? Um, I, I think it's both nature and nurture, right? Um, so when I was in my early mid twenties, I was teaching ballet and I had students on Saturday at like, 10 to 12 hours of teaching um, on Saturdays and I had kids from like three years to all the way to teenagers and um, it is amazing to me still to this day how the little personalities at age two are so strong like there's those that are just eager to please and then there are those that are just like whatever standing in a corner trying to see what they can get away with so I almost feel that I probably had a little bit of that you know, I'm the firstborn in a family. I'm the responsible one. I was always told to be, you know, I have to be good and so on and so forth. But I was also drawn to like social missions. I remember when I was maybe four or five, my, my parents went to this talk. It was in a local church and it was held by a lady, uh, a, a, like, a, like a sister, a nun. And she was working in the slums of Calcutta, basically, um working with garbage collecting garbage collectors who basically li- made a living through collecting garbage and there was like all these kids and they like were telling these stories how they you know had to sleep on a platform bed so they don't get eaten by rats and things like that and I was just like oh my god like this exists like you know why can we make the world a better place so I think that understanding of social causes and wanting to help was always just part of who I was I don't think it's one particular life event was like oh my god I need to actually care about things and then I like and then combining my interest in health as I was interested in immunology biology how the body works drug discoveries research and then you know using that for the betterment of humanity was always something I gravitated towards and I also realized that policy like making that high level change as slow moving and difficult as it is is really where I think my greatest strengths lie because it relies on convincing making cases not working but also kind of yeah just you know system level thinking that I'm drawn to as well so I don't know if there's like a life event or something it it was just like it's a natural inclination and I was you know there were these like stores that were selling like fair trade coffee and i always was in favor of fair trade coffee and i think my parents also had a very high degree of social consciousness like we didn't have a car until i was 12 because of global mm-hmm. warming and that was like in the 80s 80s oh, wow. and 90s right you, were, you were early i'm like and now i'm like well nothing i mean has really that much changed you know so um i've become a bit more cynical as i've grown older but you know my parents would eat organic only and i was like running around in kindergarten like telling kids not to eat white bread because it will cause cancer so clearly i was a fan favorite in kindergarten um but sort of that understanding of like that thoughtfulness around what do we eat how do we eat what do we consume how do we how do we move from place a to place b and why like um so i think that i was always raised as a socially conscious person Mm. um and i think that maybe helped me create the path that i'm on so yeah. yeah well i think that's what's so interesting or connected you know with what you're doing with hfi and we can we can dive into that in a bit, but uh, you, you're merging uh, a lot of you know some worlds around health and finance and kind of bridging that together and, and looking at societal issues. Uh, I think in a really neat way with a you know, lens into data and so um, the the health background and what I'm hearing you say is there is a conscious effort around just overall health, like growing up where we're just kind of health issues or, or what you put into your body at four years old in kindergarten was uh, like a, you know, something you were thinking about then. I mean, so it sounds like you health, health developed uh, on the home front, but has extended beyond. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of the organic movements and like, you know, eating healthy and healthy nutrition, we also had our own garden and things like that. I think that that definitely helped um, understand uh, an understanding of health. I mean, I don't know if, the listeners are familiar with the with the movie about a boy it's with you grand and he becomes friends with this like a little bit of an outsider who is this kid who's raised by this really old alternative mom 
and that's not the environment I grew up in, but there's one scene in that movie where the mom bakes that really healthy bread, but that's mm -hmm. like hard as a rock. And he tries to feed the ducks with it. <laughs> and then he just gets upset because he can't rip the bread apart anymore. So he takes the whole loaf of bread and just throws it onto the lake and kills the duck because it is so hard. <laughs> And my sister and I, when we watched the movie for the first time, we just died laughing because that is the type of bread I had to eat. So it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like very palatable, healthy diet, very palatable, healthy diet. There were those like hard, you know, hard as a rock breads, uh, definitely in, in on the menu as well. So, but yeah, no, I mean, I think that, um, like that that consciousness just like basically interrogating like you know who, what do you do who you are why do you do what you do and not just doing things because society demands you or that's that's just how it works was i think something that was instilled in me and i think that you know when i started to research chronic diseases and looking at the high impact so like 80 percent of the disease burden globally is caused by chronic diseases 70 percent of deaths in high income countries are caused by chronic diseases and they cost us about 5% of our GDP. I was saying, well, first of all, it's a, it's a grave injustice because it's not like a new virus and we don't know what to do about it. And if we had a new virus, we would try to find a vaccine real fast, right? But I was also saying, well, we keep publishing these studies that show that, that highlight this injustice, but we're not doing anything about it. Like, why aren't we investing more? Why aren't we applying the evidence? So that's also then why I started HFI, right? Where I said I could either keep going, producing that type of research, as important as it is, if left on the shelf, it doesn't serve the purpose it ultimately should have. So I think that, you know, seeing it, but also interrogating, like, what is the actual end result of the work that's being done? Um, there might be a correlation between kind of like how I was taught at young age on how to view the world as you were talking and and at the beginning there i was uh thinking like you know you should have been trader joe's poster child as a young <laughs> age. Uh, i don't know trader joe if you're listening i'm still up for it <laughs> no, it's clearly a fan I, I i i hit on the nerve there apparently um given that you know i've gone on my own similar health journey or you know whatever but just seeing those changes and then also like you know, it's not just about yourself, you know, you, it started with yourself, but where what's interesting for you is you said, all right, well, how does this apply and where are the issues in the rest of the world? I'm seeing and noticing and reading all these things, but what's actually being done about it? And so, you know, before we maybe go into that and blend your work into this conversation, I, I mean, this is part of your work, but why are there some parts of the world or uh, that have more chronic disease than others or, and why you know why do we have chronic disease in the first place uh right. i know it's some loaded questions but uh you're, you're no, they a great question so when i was taking a genetics course um an advanced genetics course in my undergraduate the, i remember the professor coming in and says you're all gonna die of cancer <laughs> and he says you know anyone who lives long enough will die of cancer and that's because the repair system in our body, like as you reach certain ages, something called the telomeres, which is the ends of your DNA, will basically get shorter and shorter. And the shorter these portions are, every time a cell divides, every time a cell renews, the likelihood of mutation is greater. And the likelihood of mutation will then produce um, a certain amount of can pre you know, cancerous precursors in terms of cells that if in large enough quantities, cannot no longer be um, repaired by the body. So what I'm trying to say here is like, why do we see more chronic diseases? It's because we've actually tackled infectious diseases, which is like the under five mortality, which is due to diarrhea, you know, pre uh, premature births, maternal mortality, um, you know, nutrition in the first five years. So there's something called a demographic shift and a like people are getting older and that's because of the epidemiological transition which means we now see a higher burden of chronic conditions because people start living longer hmm. but that's not the only reason then there's also like lifestyle factors and these are 
you know, sedentary behaviors, we're walking much less, we're moving much less, our diets have become much higher in salt content, much higher in refined sugar content, in chemicals, in uh, ultra-processed foods. So as countries are starting to adapt to a more Western lifestyle, um, you know, the big export of McDonald's and Burger King and Big Mac has brought about an increase in these types of chronic conditions where the four main lifestyle factors, and I want to say lifestyle, it's, it's really socioeconomic factors, is alcohol consumption, poor diet, lack of exercise, and smoking. Mm. So smoking and tobacco still kill about 9 to 10 million people each year. We have 47 million people annually dying because of chronic conditions and 70% are premature. What does that mean? We die before age 75 at an age where we shouldn't be dying because of these conditions. So what has happened is a lot of emerging economies now have both. They have, you know, HIV, malaria, infectious disease, and these chronic conditions and chronic conditions in like working age populations. So we kind of have to catch up with our policies to not be vertical in terms of a shot or like, you know, drink, put a pill in the drinking water and clean it or give a vaccine for a childhood um, for a childhood disease. But chronic conditions, as the name implies, need to be treated over and prevented over long term horizons. And that's where especially developing country health systems aren't necessarily equipped very well just yet to address these issues totally I, and I love how you talked about uh infectious diseases you know some parts of the world have, have overcome that in a lot of ways other parts of the world are still dealing with that and then you have the chronic diseases created a lot by uh how people are living um given that we are living longer but actually what we're doing to our bodies uh and, and then there's countries that are grappling with both so you know you said at the end just now, okay, well, policies need to kind of catch up. Uh, mm -hmm. I would love to hear more about that. You know, where, what, what, what is maybe broken uh, mm -hmm. about the policies of today? Um, and what do you see needing to shift? And then, okay, let's just say policies are shifted in the way that you see fit. Like, how does that kind of actually change behavior of people to, you know, let's just say increase their health span, which will in turn increase their lifespan. I know that was a lot. Did you catch all yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, no. So basically, I think the, there's like a one line answer to your, all your questions combined. And it's basically make the healthy choice, the easy choice. Mm. So anything that can facilitate like behaviors, like we know what the main risk factors are around these chronic conditions. So anything that can facilitate you know, prevention of engaging in these types of risk factors can actually support a reduction of mor morbidity, which is like a disease burden, or basically the compression of morbidity towards the end of life. And then there's also like the access. Then is the so about ninety percent of health is actually created outside the healthcare system. So like you know where we eat, where and what we eat, how we live, what we do for work, the 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 strength of our relationships. Um, determines basically our health status. And there was a there was a study that tried to reduce and find, I think, the three or four main factors that makes us live long and healthy. And I think three of the things, sleep well, like sleep enough, um, have good friends, um, exercise, mm. and eat a lot of beans. <laughs> so anyway, so these four things from a lifestyle perspective are, but then what does it mean, right, to have a, a social good social environment? What does it mean to be able to sleep a lot or sleep sufficiently? And that has a lot to do with the policies in place. Access to healthcare then also plays a role, you know, once you want to ha engage in primary prevention, secondary prevention, and, and, and tertiary care. Um, and that is where, you know, in order to have something called universal health coverage, which is basically covering people from financial losses, making sure they're covered across the diseases and making sure the majority of the population is covered. Um, for that to be a reality, a country needs to spend at least 5% of their global domestic, gross domestic product of the GDP on health. Most low-income countries, even by 2040, will not achieve that. And chronic conditions, again, like you need to detect them, you need to have trained healthcare workers, you need to 
look at the data you need to have supply chains you need to have drugs you need to for cancer you need to have radiology centers you need to have imaging centers available you need to understand as you know as a healthcare professional that overweight is not a good thing that it is a precursor for metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease and obesity and diabetes and all these kinds of things so there's a lot that needs to happen at the at the healthcare infrastructure workforce, systems, delivery, drug supply, supply chain, procurement level to be able to deal with these conditions. And the earlier you can deal with it, the more money you save, the more health you protect, and um, you know, the better equipped you are as a healthcare system. And that often isn't the case. So just to give you two stats, 50% of childhood cancers in developing countries are not diagnosed. So those children are basically sentenced to death because there's no capacity to detect them. 60% of people with diabetes in Malaysia get diagnosed in the emergency room and they either have like a loss of vision or loss of sensation in one of their limbs. And that means they're basically becoming much less productive members of society and are often still at working age, having sort of ripple effects on girls' education and everything like that. And that's because primary healthcare isn't established. So we have, like, we know we need to, resource mobilized domestically, privately, internationally. We know we need to offer technical assistance. We know what we can do to prevent, um, you know, or, or improve on these lifestyle factors, like, you know, raising taxes on alcohol, you know, being more restrictive on, uh, restrictive on tobacco sales, including those new vaping products. So we know what to do, but we also, in addition to financial resources, we also need political will and resources. And I think this is where, we're just not fast enough just nationally and globally and also um when you look at and there's also history of donors who've been giving you know donated to covid they donated to malaria hiv aids because they're often saying well i just want to do something where i can make an impact and it's much easier like you know if you send a, bil- a million vaccines and you vaccinate a million kids you have saved a million lives right how many lives do you save if you send one million vials of insulin a fewer and b it's harder to know Mm. so it's not as sexy but they often distort they often say we only give this money if we have matching from the country or from the organizations that we give money to and then even if the country says well we want health system support we want technical capacity for ncds for chronic diseases it still doesn't happen so there's a lot of that distortion going on i mean there's there's more issues it's very complex multifaceted it's what we call a wicked problem and you know hfi and my organization my organization is certainly only one player and it needs a whole of society approach basically is what i'm trying to say so we can chip away at this issue but at the end of the day the burden to solve it really rests on the shoulders of many and not the few sounds like you have the weight on the weight of the world on your shoulders day in and day out andrea how how (laughs) how does it ever not get too much uh well you know i do weightlifting and it reminds me that you know i can only build strength slowly over time and um, as one of my advisors pointed out, uh, very aware on Tuesday night over dinner, he said, well, if it's too heavy, you just can't lift it at all. And so I think we have to pick the weights that we're able to lift and then, you know, increase that weight slowly. But we can't carry the weight of our world on our shoulders because we couldn't even lift it. I didn't know we were going to get so poetic on a Thursday uh, midday, but I'm <laughs> Thursday is my favorite day. So be careful what you ask, Brian. I, I just want to keep touching on, on one more piece. And if you can bring this into your work, great. Um, but you mentioned something about uh, not, they're not being just primary. 50% of cancers on uh, go undetected in, in certain parts of the world that just don't have uh, the money or the, the systems in place. I mean, that just seems like a, a major issue. I mean, what what needs to happen just to... Make sure everyone, you know, and it could be too ambitious of a goal, but, you know, what what needs to happen to just at a baseline level ensure kids yeah. are, you know, have the opportunity to be screened for these terrible uh, diseases? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really um, health systems reform um, overall. Um, and so basically what countries need to do is they need to establish like what services they include in an essential service package. So. And then a central service package, there's an institute and we at HFI are actually collaborating with this particular initiative. It's called the Disease Control Priorities Project. And you're looking at, if you look at giving priority to the worst off, 
getting the biggest bang for the buck, following the evidence, what health interventions should be in a basic universal healthcare service package. And that would include, you know, um, imaging services, early detection of cancers, specific um, treatments and drugs that are chemotherapies that are available. Um, and then these strategies need to be basically be costed and integrated into a national health plan that then needs to be communicated to the Ministry of Health and then the Ministry of Health, uh, sorry, Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance then needs to see like, you know, A, what is the resource mobilization mechanism, right? Is there a nationally mandated insurance? Is there are there sickness funds? Like what is the way to mobilize resources to cover everyone um, with co-pays, with insurance premiums, what have you, to access these services? And on the other, so then, then there is the technical capacity, right? Like what is the what is the workforce? For example, like when I worked in Timor Leste in 2000, around 2015, I think there were four oncologists in the entire country. I mean, Timor Leste, I think, has fewer than 10 million people, but still it's there's really a lacuna of this like specialty training so it, the workforce also needs to be trained in country or also there's brain drain going on so you need to have working conditions to actually retain the healthcare workforce in your country mm -hmm. liberia several years back had i think one cardiologist for the entire country like it's like nigeria had like one um radiology center in lagos and my friend um she was the austrian trade commissioner to Africa and I was stationed in Lagos and she was like well if you have cancer you don't want to stay in Nigeria she says you get your imagery somewhere else you get your treatment somewhere else because the the and you know it's gotten better since but there needs to be infrastructure investments and infrastructure is very capital intensive right so countries would have to then probably apply for loans from organizations like the World Bank and others to build that capacity internally but they then also need to be able to pay back and you know for them, some of us who have watched this the, the the fiscal space of countries during COVID, some countries gdp has actually shrunk right so that means the healthcare capacity the budget for healthcare has shrunk as well and so that's a huge issue and then of course there can be international assistance so we've had we've seen like you know 30 billion dollars a year mobilized in the last couple of years for COVID alone but that's not going to be enough to cover everyone for cancer care, right? So there needs to really be a sustainable financing strategy and a sustainable like national budget allocation. So you can then find efficiencies and says, okay, we want to make sure that we only tra treat certain cost effective based on cost effectiveness. We only want to make sure that we, you know, we want to de detect these, um, these cancers early so that we can prevent the high costs at the end stage of the treatment and so on but it still costs something and those resources still need to be mobilized and i think this is where we're having difficulty because the resource mobilization both at the global private and national level is just not commensurate with the progression of the disease burden mm. wow. so we know what to do but we need you know we need money and political right. commitment and ways to raise that money basically yeah and it i was as you were talking i was just thinking about how much money goes towards investments that just really don't push society forward and it's, it's dealing with capital uh countries political systems it sounds super nuanced and complex kind of a thread um thread it all together and, and andre i appreciate the, the breakdown i mean you are you are uh working on some big hairy uh problems what uh tell us about hfi tell us why you started it uh what more about what the organization does i know you're you know all over these issues but uh i would love for you to just give context to you know your work today yeah no so basically it's a health finance institute we're in our fifth year of operations we're based in dc we're a nonprofit organization and um our tagline is basically no nobody chooses disease so ncds nobody chooses diseases and we're focused on um, building partnerships of innovative finance, um, making the impact uh, case uh, for investing in health and prevention access and adherence to these types of to chronic disease related treatments, as well as advocacy and thought leadership on these issues. So the reason I founded it was that I had been working over 
over 10, close to 15 years in the space of um, chronic disease um, funding and global financing. And there were three UN high level meetings in 2011, 2014, 2018. And each of these meetings had some resolutions associated with it. And in 2011, we said, we came up with a study at Harvard and a number, it was a Harvard World Economic Forum joint study um, and that's still highly cited um, that $47 trillion, so $47 trillion are lost to the world economy because if we maintain the status quo of inaction towards chronic diseases between 2011 and 2025. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, we're going to present this paper and some world leader is going to be like, oh, gee, this is a massive amount of uh, money lost. We cannot afford to do so. Let's, you know, Let's invest in prevention. Let's invest in these um, in these conditions. And nothing happened. 2014, nothing happened. 2018, I had finished my PhD at Harvard and I was working in Paris at the OECD and had brokered a relationship between OECD and something called the UN in the Agency Task Force for NCDs that represented 42 UN organizations on, on this issue. And I had pushed for saying like, look, we need to make this a high and low income in country issue. The private sector has a mandate to be engaged now because of the sustainable development goals. 20% of the funding should come from the private sector. We need to integrate them in our dialogue. You know, even though I was there representing OECD at, this, at these meetings, and again, I just felt there was just like so much red tape and I felt that if an organization existed that brought the evidence to bear that I talked about earlier around the, the, the economic burden, but also the effectiveness of the interventions that we have and created this neutral convening platform between the public and the private sector and also presented novel ideas and ways to blend public and private resources, I thought that, you know, that could be sort of a third way of working in the second best solution space of where we are in healthcare financing to, to, to move the needle. And so after we incubated the Institute at Harvard and then we launched and the first piece of work we performed was the building a business plan for multi-partner trust fund for chronic diseases, which has since been launched. Um, we, we were able to, you know, engage with various different countries and, and really help and broker set up some of these public private financial partnerships to create better access, but also greater affordability for care. Um, yeah. So I hope that's, it was a very long answer to your question, but yeah. it's a very complex issue. So, no, it reminds me of you fighting your way through school, uh, as a, the, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it's just it's some patterns continue, Andrea. It's a, it's a good pattern. Uh, no, it's, I mean, I, I think it's so neat when you can combine something you, you deeply care about for the world and use it as a means and a vehicle to. Uh, make a difference in the world and, and pay yourself doing it. And uh, I think you've you've done just that. I know you have much bigger ambitions with with everything you're doing, but uh, I mean, even just in the last few years, I mean, what what uh, you've been able to be involved with and do, I think, is is so meaningful. Uh, and, and I want you to speak to that. You know, as you look at uh, what you've been able to be a part of, stand up through HFI. What are some of the things that you're doing right now? Uh, in 2023, about to go into 2024, that, that you're really excited about with the organization uh, and, and hopes for the future uh, with, yeah. with where you see it going? So one of the initiatives that we started incubating and hoping to launch at a much larger scale is something called the Health Impact Credit. And the, the idea behind it is, is basically to accredit companies for the health that they create or fail to create. So think about you know, um, McDonald's having to buy impact credits from Moderna because they produce too many burgers and too much obesity, right? And the reason we are working on this is that because of these large scale numbers and issues that we're talking about. So when you're a nonprofit organization, you know, you always have the task of fundraising for yourself. And then also like, you know, the, the scale at which you can operate sometimes may not move the needle as much as you would like to on such a big issue. What we, however, see is, is that, um, you know, the, 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 the commercial determinants, both positive and negative that health has, play a huge role on health and the wealth 
of, of nations. And if we can be part of an index or we can set an index and a standard um, based on which this health impact is measured and correlated to the bottom line of companies, showing that companies that do invest in health actually can do better, those investments, it becomes a, we don't have to fight for money for health. It yeah. will become it will become very obvious and easy, easily defensible of why investments in better, the betterment of health or companies, the better the health um, are a good thing. So that's an initiative we're incubating and really excited to take forward. And we think it also has the opportunity to really um, reach the scale that's needed to make an impact on the chronic disease issues. Um, and then on the on the uh, project front, we are moving towards um, setting up a revolving fund for um, continuous glucose measurement devices in Mexico with some of our partners. So there was a program that was set up for underserved youth about two, two and a half years ago. And um, we've now been approached by other foundations to help basically set up a revolving fund with our partners there. And that's really exciting for us. Um, and there are some other um uh, blended finance funds, so funds that combine public and private finance uh, structures in the making. I uh, can't say too much, but um, please do stay tuned on, on with regards to these developments. All right. Well, uh, just to speak to, and you said that uh, health impact score, is, is, that, is that what you said? Yeah, we call it health impact credit, HIC. Credit, credit. I, I, okay, credit. But I, I think uh, that is super interesting. It's like creating a a global rating like what is uh the global rating of the, the nation's credit you know but for health uh exactly yeah and, and it's not just a rating but it actually re will not just be a rating will actually that rating will deter will actually signify a certain health impact like the same way you can quantify a unit yeah. of carbon emissions you can actually also quantify a unit of health and so we'll have meaning as well in the, in the health impact sense Totally. And if you build this out, like what, if you, let's just say every country had their health impact credit kind of rating, mm -hmm. do you see this almost being like a baseline for saying where do investment dollars need to go um, to fix certain issues? Is that kind of how you're thinking about it? It could be. Um, so, for example, it could be integrated into the S of ESG ratings, which is, you know, are becoming more standardized in Europe. It could be integrated into um, IFRS system, which is basically the types of things that need to be audited for companies. So automatically it would correlate with their bottom line. If you apply it to countries, you can think about it this way, right? Like we know that countries that under invest in chronic diseases fare worse economically than countries compared to countries that do. To give you an example, 9%, like the, the sorry, to give you an example, the burden of chronic diseases on the US economy is like an if as high as an effective tax rate of 9%. So it's basically like we would collectively make 9% more money, more income in the US if we were actually applying evidence as it should be applied towards chronic conditions, right? So we, if countries or communities are being rated based on, um, based on their investment and the health score of their population, you could almost think that that could impact your triple your, your credit rating that you have as a country, right? Or as a community. So like, you know, the, whatever, Fairfax's, this bonds, municipal bonds have an A, you know, triple A rating because their communities are healthy versus some other communities that are not, right? right? That, I mean, that is if everything works out well, I think it's this type of score is first and foremost, more most applicable to the food and beverage industry and the pharma industry than portfolio companies um, and hopefully much more widely. Um, applying it to um, like governments per se, I think a lot of things need to happen, not just from a business front, but actually a, a political commitment to it as well. So yeah. you can think about it like, you know, tying it to certain carbon credit goals, right? Because there is this linkage mm -hmm. between climate change and health. So that might be the first avenue to actually think about um, applying this at the, you know, public level or the government uh, credit worthiness level. It seems so interesting as I'm, I mean, we've talked about this before, but I feel like I'm connecting a lot more things and, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll go on a little tangent and bring this back. I was having a conversation with this guy this summer about diabetes and talking about how a lot of, you know, he was telling me enriching, no matter, you know, 50% of people who have diabetes, he said, like, come actually from very kind of health, like uh, financially, like strong backgrounds or like areas and it's not always just 
where you live, but I think what I'm hearing you, you say is a lot of these chronic conditions, a lot of these diseases, like there's a massive importance on the environment that's created by the countries. So people can make the behaviors maybe more in their favor um, when like the, the structures on the ground floor for where they're born are in a favorable direction for them from the start. And I think that's a really, you know, unique perspective um, on just, you know, the, the, the conversation at large, and, which leads me to ask you because you know you're talking about these initiatives that you want to you know you're creating you're, you want to create what you want to see and i'm just curious maybe this is a call for donors here but where, <laughs> where where are you where do you struggle to raise money in this process because to me like these problems are so you know the way you describe it it's so vivid of like what the issues are like what are the challenges in raising money and like what oh they're huge they're huge um, so thanks. Yeah, let's call out the donors right all now, donors. you know, <laughs> all donors, large and small. We take, you know, we take them all. The issue is, is that um, in in terms of those organizations that so first of all, only three percent of development assistance of health or fewer than that goes to chronic diseases. So um, of all the money, the not a 60 billion dollars that are being spent, less than 3% goes to chronic conditions, or maybe it's not even less than 2%. So there are the donor pool is absolutely unaligned and misaligned with, um, with the disease burden, right? So, and then for example, um, USAID, which is the, you know, donor agency in the my main bilateral agency in the United States, they don't fund chronic diseases. The Gates Foundation does not fund programs on chronic diseases. Um, many of the other donors don't either. So, you know, when people say, well, I'll just work with Gates because you work on health. Well, that's not so easy because they won't touch chronic diseases. And even with primary healthcare initiatives that they have, they don't include that. Now, so the donor pool is actually very, very small. And we find that, and then, you know, the family offices that also write bigger checks often have very specific, you know, geographic goals, like they want to give to Texas alone, or they want to give to this, they want to give to that. And then thirdly, the work that we do, like we're not on the ground, like, you know, we're not handing out, you know, um, whatever, plumpy nut, which is basically preventing diabetes for kids to like starving children, right? We're really saying this is such a massive issue. We need to really have policy solutions and we have impact. So we just won like the UN Interagency Task Force Awards for NCDs at the UN General Assembly three weeks ago. So we our work is impactful and recognized, but we don't have that like, you know, each five dollars will buy a, a packet of books for children kind of appeal for donors. Right. So I think that is like one of the big challenges that we have. And we're also like a smaller and a newer organization. We're not incubated at, you know, no, we're not springing out of the World Health Organization. We're not incubated at a, a big university. We are really started because of a fundamental belief that we need to actually be part of the solution through our work. But that has with it, brings with it challenges of being the new kid on the block and being an atypical type of uh, nonprofit organization. We're not the pet project of, you know, a wealthy individual. We were founded because we believe that this issue remains unaddressed and it's a social injustice. Um, and so, you know, raising money for a cause that is under addressed and not that well known is like that proverbial plane that you need to build as you fly. So it is very tough to raise money in this space. And so we do um, some of our revenue also comes from like projects that we do with clients. So events that we organize, papers that we write and things like that. But for the longevity of the mission of our nonprofit, it's absolutely like critical to have like a diverse and, and long-term um, oriented donor base. You have your hands full for sure on uh, bringing in all the dollars. But uh, I, I know with your ballet story, how you got HFI off the ground or your ministry story, HFI, like I I'm, have all the confidence that you will continue to find the ways to uh, get the get the funds uh, in order for, for you to be able to have the impact that you want. So um, Andrea, this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, 
I mean, truly, truly a great episode. Uh, where can people find you, reach out to you, um, and donate? Absolutely. Well, there's a donation button on our website, um, healthfinanceinstitute.org. Very easy, very front and center. Um, reach me at Andrea at healthfinanceinstitute.org or find me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I'm most active. Um, and yeah, look forward to hearing from, you know, your listeners or maybe inspired future board members, donors, all of supporters, them. volunteers, all of the above. Awesome. Excited. And uh, thanks for your time. No, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining me on The One Away Show. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Have a One Away moment you'd like to share? Follow me on Twitter or Instagram at BrianWish underscore or reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me about the moment that altered your life. The One Away Show is produced by ArcBound a company dedicated to helping entrepreneurs, experts, and visionaries launch authentic personal brands. From message development to podcast production, social media content generation, and book writing, we work with you to create your arc. Head to arcbound.com to learn more. Thank you for listening, and please join me next time on The One Away Show.